these early mornings. They are just fantastic. Uh, if you are outside, come on in. Um, and if you're inside here, thanks so much for joining us. It is so great to have you. Uh, if you want to stand with us, we're going to worship our God with one song. It's called Battle Belongs. So sing nice and loud. <laughs> battle you see my victory when all I see is the mountain you see the mountain move and as I walk through the shadows your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I sink through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you fall, and if you are for us, who can be against us? For Jesus, for Jesus, Nothing impossible for you. come and gather together, that we can worship you, that we can learn about you, and that we can encourage one another in our faith to grow stronger. God, I pray that your spirit would just be here this morning and that you would uplift us in this time. I pray all this in your name. Amen. You can grab a seat. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Kyle. I'm the youth pastor here at Church on the Rock. I'm so excited to see so many of you here today. Uh, a quick uh, announcement that if you have a phone on you, which you most likely do, uh, feel free to share our service uh, on YouTube. And so that's churchontherock.ca slash live so that more, more people uh, can have access to this because you never know who will watch it if they just see a link to it up. Um, also, you'll see one of these connection cards either on your seat or the seat next to you. And if you're new here, we'd love if you would fill this out and we'll even give you this very cool t-shirt uh, at the end of the service when you hand it in. And we would love to connect with you. And also, uh, there's a space on the back. If you have any prayer or praise requests that you would like um, our team to pray over throughout this week, then feel free to write that on the back over there. Now, we're about to dismiss the kids for today, but first, we're going to go into a community time. And so what this is, is this is a time where we'll give you a prompt, um, and you can get up, find someone that you've never met before, you don't know very well, and just jumpstart a conversation with them um, and try to be as friendly as possible, uh, and we give you a question to help with that. And so the question for today is, what is your favorite season? And after a very cold morning like this morning, I can definitely say that I do not like fall or winter, and spring is still too cold, so I like summer. Give me just warmth where I can go outside in a short, shorts and a t-shirt, and I would rather sweat my butt off than feel cold. So that's my answer. Find someone uh, and let them know which season you like. And Chris is already telling me she doesn't agree with my answer. So if you like summer, I'm not saying stay away from Krista, but... You never know. Okay, go find someone and, and chat them up. Vladimir, and I received my beautiful shoebox gift. I was only nine years old, living in Kiev, Ukraine, where sharing the gospel was not popular or allowed. My family often faced persecution because of sharing the gospel, as well as poverty. We often lacked basic necessities, such as hygiene items, clothes, and even food. And due to our poverty, we could not afford toys. But one day, one special day, all of that changed when I received my beautiful and colorful shoebox gift. It was my first gift ever, and my favorite item inside was a dental floss. God used it to show me his unconditional love. 
We are so grateful for your partnership with Operation Christmas Child. We're grateful for your longtime partnership as a central drop-off location. Let me tell you, your hard work does not go unnoticed. May God bless you all. Bye-bye. Church on the Rock. Uh, all right, awesome, awesome. Uh, I love how uh, how many of you uh, like uh, have this a great divide about Christmas, and uh, I know that we can't really start it before before Remembrance Day. Although I saw Christmas trees up in uh, people's houses, and uh, I know a lot of people can't start before December. So I hope we can all get along as Christians. It's just a good thing that we can still get along. Well, we are, uh, we are um, uh, sort of on week number two of a series, and if you're new here to Church on the Rock, I'm Dave Overhold, our lead pastor, and uh, as we go through these series, we take a topic and we dig deep into it. We try and, and, and find out as much as we can about one topic, and so uh, here we are on week number two, and before we get into it, I'm going to pray that God would actually open up his word and that we can understand it, that we can get some things from it. Uh, so let's uh, pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. It's so rich. Thank you for all the, uh, the great people of God before us. And Father, they have, sh they have showed us so many good lessons. Lord, help us to find something, something good and useful, something that uh, will help us day by day this morning. I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Um, at one time, uh, when our church was very small, we did a lot of things for uh, youth groups. And one of them, we, uh, we put on a youth conference. Yes, our church put on a youth workers conference. And we would have about anywhere from three to 500 youth workers that came in. It was amazing. I remember uh, one, uh, one of the times, we, we planned it always in the first uh, weekend in April. It was kind of before summer, uh, sometimes trying not to hit Easter. Uh, we, we just tried to make it uh, during a time where youth workers can come out and learn. We would fly in big-name speakers from uh, around the world and uh, rent HDCH. We would have bands. I remember one year we did this. Uh, we had, uh, I had a couple speakers from Chicago coming in, and, uh, and we had planned the, these uh, neat bands. It was going to be an amazing time. And uh, they, they flew in on the, the Friday, and we're getting ready for the day conference on uh, on the, on the Saturday, uh, to be able to put on something like that, we were, it was going to cost us around $25,000, $25,000. So it was like a bit of a, a gulp to go, we just really hope a lot of people show up for this. We just really hope every time we sort of, you know, hold our breath, there's some people who, you know, put out the, uh, the money for it early, some wait for the last minute. Youth workers are notorious for the last minute. I remember, uh, you know, having, having that, you know, sort of hanging out with these uh, speakers from Chicago Friday night. Saturday was going to start. And as I got up, I opened the window. This is the first weekend in April, right? There's just like white of this massive amount of snow just falling all around. And I said, no, not, not in, you know, in Canada. Can we really have snowstorms in April? <laughs> yeah, I should have figured that one out. So I remember, you know, going out, how bad is it? And already, already, at least a foot or more had fallen. And this is early in the morning. I thought, okay, no, this is good. People will still make it. People will drive in from Toronto. No problem. And then as I was getting ready to head out to HDCH, I uh, decided to listen on the radio. And they said that a freak storm, just a freak storm, they're expecting three feet of snow. The police had said, don't go out of your house. Please don't go out of your house because it's going to be dangerous. And I'm just saying, no, no. So with all the faith of Moses, 
I pour my, my, my four wheels on. I drive to HDCH. This is no kidding. And I can't see in front of me. You know, I'm just hoping there's nobody else on the road. I pull into their parking lot, and I stand out. It's like a movie. My coat's open. It's flapping in the wind. And I hold up my arms to heaven saying, No! Stop in the name of Jesus! You know what happened? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. I said it many times that Charlton Heston would be put to shame. It's just like I, if I had a staff, I would have held up the staff high and said, stop, be gone. I tried everything. You know, Gandalf would, yeah, he, he'd be proud of me. Now, you cannot pass. You cannot pass. Well, we discovered very quickly that I started to get phone calls and emails and, and all that communication to say, can't come, we can't come, we can't come. This is canceled, right? This is canceled, right? This is canceled, right? And, and guess who gets to make the decision, right? And everybody else in the band says we can't be there. Well, I, I can play a guitar. You know, there can be three people each. They can pay $10,000 each to come. <laughs> so eventually I canceled the event. And uh, it, was inter- it was at a time when the church was a $1 church. It was pretty much either $1 in a bank account or we we're in debt $1. That was about where we stood. And uh, we we're out tens of thousands of dollars. And uh, I remember it threw off our budget next to the previous year. It affected, you know, how much people got paid, myself included. It was just a bad time. And I, I was asking for a true miracle. I was asking God to recalibrate nature. And sometimes he does. Sometimes he does. But uh, can I just tell you, it's weird, isn't it, out of all the different things we go through? I was pretty shaken by that one. I don't know why that one shook me, because I've gone through other bad things, but that one somehow shook me. And uh, I started to ask, God, why? I know you have the power. You could have held off that storm for 24 hours. You know, uh, he should have, you know, pushed it off to North Bay, the people in North Bay, they're, they're used to it, right? Or put it down to Buffalo. They live in this stuff. But why Hamilton? And then, and then you start, you know, questioning yourself, right? You start saying, did I do something wrong? You know, am, am I in the wrong? Didn't I hear well? And I, I start to, to realize, hold on, I've had tons of answers to prayer. I can, I can go back and, in my journals and see all kinds of answers to prayer. I remember my first one, I was at a camp, and I loved it so much. God, you got to keep me at, in a camp atmosphere. Out of the blue, somebody... Uh, somebody sent me a letter. I said, can you come and help us out at camp? At a whole different camp through the, the rest of the summer. It was a miracle. It was, it was amazing. I've seen answers to prayer. I have journals with answers to prayer. But somehow God did not say yes. Can I say that in each of your lives, if it hasn't happened yet, it will, that there will be moments and times when your faith is shaken. And you'll ask the same questions I did. God, God, why? Why did this happen? Did I do something wrong? Is, is, you know, did I hear it wrong? What is going on? And this is why we're having this series called Standing Through the Storm. Uh, We're trying to come out of here. What's some practical steps on how we can stand through the storm? Last week, we said, listen, if we build our life around Jesus' teaching, storms will come. It will come, but the goal is to keep standing through the storm. It's not to, you know, call down the storms and stop the storms. It's so that God can help us to stand. He said if we build our lives around his teachings, the storms will come, but our houses, our lives will not collapse around us. And so we said, well, let's wrap our minds around why do storms come to the in the beginning. And we came up with three reasons that there's God's world. He made a coherent world that sometimes he steps into, but... Often he doesn't. And there's free will. Our free will just affects each other. There's God's war, and God is not the only supernatural actor on stage. And and next week we're going to be talking about the spiritual battle. We're going to be talking about uh, how how to wage war in the spirit world. If you're interested in that, make sure you, uh, you tune in for that one. And then God's will, God's number one desire, is even gulp, not our happiness. What? How can this be? God's number one desire is our relationship with him. The, the gift of salvation is not all just answers to prayer. It's actually himself. Himself. 
So, so we, we can come to God and surrender our lives to him as our creator. Uh, interesting, I was reading a, a great book by Peter Gregg, and uh, it's called uh, God on Mute. And if you ever want a great book to be able to, to uh, dig into this more, I think it's a classic. It's one of my probably top five books I've ever read. I, I've read it several times, God on Mute. And he, one of the things he said, well, maybe by adjusting our expectations, we can reduce the sense of, sense of disappointment, isolation, and unfairness riding on the back of unanswered prayer. He uh, gave an illustration. He said, let's say you and a bunch of other families are living in uh, some building, and it's, it's nice, but it's, it's not great. It's like the, the colors mismatch, and and uh, looks like some old radiators there instead of a nice, you know, actually not... Uh, a nice uh, heating system. But, uh, you know, every, every one of your rooms have, uh, you know, windows. And, and there's food available, and it's, and it's good food. He said, let's say you live, two families live in a, in a place like this. But one family believes that they're in a five-star hotel. What would they say? They said, what? The room service. They should be having better food than this. What, you know, this is an old radiator. That's horrible. And they complain because they think they're living in a five-star hotel. Whereas the other set of people believe they're in a prison, in a war zone. And they go, we have heat. (laughs) We have food. In fact, this is not a bad place. This is good. Thank you, God, for all that you've given us. Same place. Different set of expectations. And so, uh, as uh, Peter Gregg says, when we finally accept the fact that life is not a five-star hotel, and lay down our indignation at the way we're being treated, that we finally find hope. We finally find hope. It's interesting. Did you know that God does not even get all things he wants? Isn't that wild? God does not get all the things that he wants. Well, hold on, hold on, Dave. He's God, so if he wants something, he'll just get it, right? Let me read to you a verse in 2 Peter 3, 9. God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. That's his heart. He doesn't want a soul to perish. He doesn't want anyone to spend forever away from him. (laughs) But everyone to come to repentance. He wants everyone in his family. That's his big desire. And he doesn't get it because not everyone gives their life to him. And so as we (laughs) end up in God's world where there's free will and God's war where there's supernatural actors and God's will where his number one heart is a relationship with us, how can we stand in the storm? Well, the second way we're going to stand in the storm, I'm going to be using, uh, we're going to be talking a bit about light, about light. Um, often I'll go up to Algonquin Park, and I love canoeing. I love canoeing. I have a solo canoe. It's light. It's about 34 pounds. It's beautiful, and it's only 15 feet. I have enough that I can pack in there and go and do some solo camping. So I'll, I'll go. I, I've, I've been to this, this one lake. It takes two portages. I've been there so many times. I can go there, I think, in the dark, because I remember once going up there, and is the fog just was... was you couldn't see in front of you. I go, do I want to wait the two hours to, for the fog to lift? And I go, no, I'm just going to canoe. So I, I just like canoed right into the fog bank. But I knew where I was going. I hit the portage. I hit the portage. And finally, when I got to my lake, the, the fog was just lifting. It's, it's, a, it's someplace I feel very comfortable being there. But in the middle of the night, where you're away from any city light at all, when you are way far away, and it's cloudy, and there's no stars and no moon. It's weird feeling. It's so black, dark up there. You just, you go like that. I've tried that sometimes. I can't see that. <laughs> it's like nothing. There is absolutely no light around. I go, that's just freaky. It's really freaky. And what adds to the freak factor is that you hear noises outside your tent. <laughs> that is just not good. You go, and you think that they're right next to you, right? And you know they're all bears that are going to eat you. But, <laughs> you know, instead of it's probably a little red squirrel hopping around us somewhere, right? Or a, or a mouse. And so I'm going, oh, okay, no, must get to sleep. You know what becomes my best friend? <laughs> this thing. This thing, my, my flashlight. This, this is the flashlight I use, okay? And uh, it's, uh, hopefully I'll, I'll, it works for me. <laughs> 
The beautiful thing, I love this flashlight, and I keep it with me. It's a source of comfort, safety, and opens up direction. The Bible talks a lot about light, about light. The Bible is just filled with, with images of light. And Jesus says this in, in John 8, 12. He says, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. Since we already know what the world is like, God's world, God's war, God's will, it's a dark place. We live in a dark place. Not only that, we, we live in a place where there's lots of creaky noises out there. Some that just work on our fears. Some that are dangerous. You know what Jesus says? Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me, and as believers, that's what we do. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Isn't that awesome? It's almost as if God has this big, you know, lantern, and he's the light of the world. You can live in darkness if you want, but if you don't want that kind of fear of imagined noises or fear of real things, stick close and follow Jesus. It's, it's, it's amazing. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In other words, that light is not just not keeping you, you know, the, the noises away. It actually brings light. I, uh, I have uh, one of my uh, favorite, uh, uh, favorite TikTok people or, or, uh, that, that uh, go on my feed. is a guy called Chris Bird. Chris Bird is an Old Testament uh, theologian. And uh, he, uh, he, he used this one phrase that was beautiful. He said, sometimes, sometimes you need to borrow light. You need to borrow light. So well, what, what, does, what does that mean, borrow light? And I got thinking about batteries. Batteries are interesting things, aren't they? Okay, just hang with me for a while. All right, not many people really consider batteries that much. But you know what a battery is? That's wild. It's just stored energy, right? Sometimes some water fell over, you know, Niagara Falls through a turbine, created electricity. That electricity went somewhere to a factory, which put it into a battery. So this is, it's actually borrowing energy or borrowing light from another source. And you can carry it with you. And it's, it's available if you put it in the flashlight. And so in the same way, he said, listen, sometimes in our darkest moments, we need to be able to borrow light. Borrow light. Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my, the light of my salvation. The Lord is the light of my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? We're going to be talking about borrowing light today in three different ways. Number one, to borrow light from the past. To borrow light from the past. Now, right now, in my own devotional walk, I'm studying through the book of Psalms. And there are several Psalms that were written 500 years before Moses was on the scene. Uh, sorry, after Moses was on the scene. That talk about the Red Sea. And if you understand biblical history, Moses, you know, took the children of Israel through the Red Sea. Then, became, then, then came the time of Judges. And then after that time of Judges, we have David who are writing psalms. And there's some people who are psalm writers after David. And so this is like hundreds of years after the whole Moses event. And yet, this is what some of the psalms say in Psalm 136, 13 to 14. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder... His love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it. His love endures forever. This psalm writer is saying, listen, I know God loves me. How do you know he loves you? Because guess what? 500 years ago, he opened up the Red Sea. And it was a miracle. And it was amazing. It was, God was, was did this huge thing. And I, I, I know what we would say. We would say, okay. Has he done anything lately? <laughs> you know, is there anything sort of more recent than about 500 years ago? Right? It did not seem to, to bother the psalm writers. Psalm 77 is another example. Now, Psalm 77, it, it starts, he says, I cried out to God and I refused to be comforted. God has forgotten mercy. He's just saying, God, why have you left me? What, you don't even listen to me anymore. He's in the midst of a storm. And in Psalm 77, 11, 12, but then I remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I remember your miracles long ago, yeah, hundreds of years ago. When I, I will consider all your works. 
and meditate on all your mighty deeds. He says, listen, I'm going to take some time. I'm going to intentionally go and borrow light from the past. I'm going to say, God, I'm in darkness right now, but I'm going to reach back and grab some of the light from the past and bring it forward because I need some light. I need some light. In fact, the Bible often talks about remember, remember, one of the most frequent commands in the Bible. People, the people of God were warned not to forget God's deeds. Do this in remembrance of me. We just need to remember what God has done. Because in the midst of your storm, sometimes it becomes foggy about what he has done. You know, one of the questions I'm asked often, especially people who are new at, at our church, it's fun. We had our uh, workshop, workshop on, uh, on reading the Bible, creative ways. There's a couple of people there that were new to Church on the Rock. I, uh, I showed them the building, and they said, wow, this is really cool. By the way, if you've not been inside that place, it is amazing. So it's like, okay, they're going, we sense God here, and God, oh, this is amazing. And they, so, I said, so I said, so when, when, when are you guys going to move in? <laughs> right? And I go, yeah, yeah, we're close. The, the city has, has given us check marks on every single Department now. So there should be no reason why we don't get our plans, right? <laughs> God bless the city. I pray for the city often. Uh, and then I go, no, it's taken us about 13 years to go through those plans. And you can see the, oh. And I can hear the little voices in the back of my mind or from other people that say, wow, Dave, you probably got this wrong. Is something wrong with you? Is something wrong with the church? Is there something going on wrong? Because God should have just rolled that forward, right? Because God doesn't wait on things. Because if he go is, he's, he's going to do it, he's going to do it right away, isn't he? <laughs> have you read the Bible? <laughs> and so I have to remember. I have to remember that we had no facilities, no land for 10 years. Years. You know what we did for 10 years? We prayed. We prayed, 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 prayed for 10 years. And all of a sudden, <laughs> I, I, we're looking at this piece of land, and uh, God bless the, I won't tell you the full story, but it's a, it's, a, it's a miracle. I was literally walking over the land. Somebody had already given us a word from God that whenever there's footprints in the snow, we would get a piece of land. I look back, it's the first time it snowed in that season. There's footprints all over the place. And I go, that's awesome, God. I still need the money, though. And so I go back home, and there's a beep on my answering machine. And it's a dear, dear man who didn't even go to our church, that beautiful couple. And... He fooled around with me a little bit. He said, so I heard about this piece of land. Looks like a good one. Do you need help? And yeah, how much? And a lot. And he offered the exact amount for us to buy that. That was something that was not, it was at a, a very unique situation in his life that he could do that. And all the things aligned so we have a piece of land that we, that we in no way, could have paid for ourselves. And so as I stand before that person and go, yeah, it's been a while for us to work through this. Guess what I do? Guess what I do? So I don't become discouraged. I borrow light from the past. God, no, you gave us this place. You gave us this place in a miracle. We prayed for this place for 10 years. And guess what? We didn't have to do a big fundraising camp. No, you just gave this to us, God. And this is a miracle. And I'm standing in the midst of a miracle. And he's going to continue on that miracle. Thirteen years later, right, I'm standing in the storm because I can borrow light from the past. And so how do we do that? How do we handle this? Well, this is why we as Christians, we need to ask God for, for small prayers to be answered all the time. You need to keep on bringing, you need to, to keep on praying our daily bread prayers. Oh, God, can you give us our daily bread? Which means a lot of different things. Can you help us with this and this and this? Why, why do you need this? You need to journal them down and you need to hold on to them because there's going to become a time when you hit a storm and you go, where are you, God? And, and you need to borrow light from your past. You need to borrow that. And if and there's some people who just lose their faith in the midst of storms, and, and this is not in the Bible. This is just what I, I've discovered. You know 
generally what happens is people that, I don't want to bother God, that's such a small thing, I don't want to talk to God about that, yeah, it's okay. I'll ask him when a big thing comes up. And when a big thing comes up and God does not answer, they have nothing to draw on, they have no no light to borrow from. And so Christians, come on, come on, ask God for everything. Come on, you know, sometimes he'll say, yes, wait, no, it doesn't matter. You're going to build up some light that you can need to borrow from the past. So we borrow light from the past. Not only that, we borrow light from the wounded. We borrow light from the wounded. Sometimes we have to find light for those who have endured. Those leaders with a limp in their souls. Uh, this uh, interesting quote said, those from John Howard Griffin, those who have, uh, have known pain profoundly are the ones most wary of uttering the cliches about suffering. God is creating more and more wounded healers. God says, listen, I am going to comfort my people, but sometimes I'm going to comfort them through people who have not had a perfect life, who have not had it easy, now, everything hasn't all come together. Sometimes I'm going to use those with wounds. In fact, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4, it says the God of all comfort, isn't that great? That's where all our comfort comes from. Who comforts us in all our troubles, he's there for each one of you. Uh, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So in other words, when we need help from others, we need to go to people who have gone through the ringer. So how did you make it through that? How did you make it through the ringer? Because God somehow hung together with you. You two were good through that. And then yeah, you, you talk to somebody that, that's been, been wounded, and, and as they, they continue to heal, they'll go, I'm not sure if I made it. If I'm making it, these are the things that God's helped me with. It's dangerous for me to look around the room because I can look into the eyes of people that I know that have gone through that. Do you know that we are in a room with saints of holy life who have gone through tremendous pain and still love God? So we sometimes need to borrow light not just from our past but from the wounded. I read biographies sometimes and... Um, one of the, my uh, favorite biographies, I have a book with little biographies that lets me get through a lot of them, is a guy called Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was from England. He founded the China Inland Mission. He was one of the first missionaries to go into China, just having such a deep passion for the Asian people. And he started this mission, and during his lifetime, uh, he opened up 205 mission statements. He called over 800 missionaries to, to, uh, to the Chinese people. And he just basically opened up all of inland China to the good news of Jesus. And we see the, the ripple of his life. He's an amazing man. He wasn't understood well. He dressed in the garb of the people, grew out his hair long and a big long ponytail. People just not, did not get him back in England because he was just so different. One of the latest uh, little biographies I read of him, he said he... Uh, he struggled with depression. Hold on. How could he struggle with depression? I found out he lost three of his children there and his wife. And then I, I, I read some of his writings. You know what he talks about most? He talks about daily drinking deeply from the presence of God. You can just say how much he loved Jesus and you go how how could you except he has been wounded but yet he said listen Jesus is worth it all and he's been beside me and when I drink deeply of his presence I can live another day sometimes I wonder about Paul's uh, in the Bible Paul's uh, influence why was he so influential? Why did he change the world so much? He was smart, a Pharisee. He was, he was sat under Gamaliel, a, a, a really well-studied Pharisee. He was tremendous. He had tremendous drive. But can I say, maybe just another facet of Paul's life that you might not have thought about. <laughs> you, 
there's, there's, a, there's a thing if you get punished, you get 40 lashes minus one, 39 lashes. And that's supposed to bring you to death's door, but not quite kill you. Not dead, quite dead, right? That, that kind of thing. And so that happened to Paul. Just imagine the scars on him. You know, that happened to him five times. You go, oh my goodness. You just, oh my goodness. You get another job, right? Come on, right? Couldn't you make some more money doing something else? And then, and that was with the, 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 the people he'd come from, his, his Jewish friends. He was beaten with rods. These are, are Roman magistrates that, that keep the rods in the back as they, they hold, uh, hold court. And if they find you worthy of punishment, they take the rods out and they just beat you until you're senseless all over your body. That happened to him three times. He was stoned to death three times. <laughs> and then, and then he, he survived out in the open ocean for 24 hours. And so imagine somebody like that coming to Church on the Rock. All right? Imagine somebody coming like that. You go, don't take off your shirt, man. <laughs> it's like, and then he goes in and leans in and says, Jesus is real. He is my, my, my Savior. Imagine. Ma imagine what moral authority he has because of this. Because of this. Not only should we be reflecting on Paul, we should be reflecting on Jesus. There's going to be a time real soon here where it's open for Christians to take communion. And when we're there, one of the things we're supposed to reflect on is what God has gone through, Jesus himself. I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 12, 2 and 3. Often Christians are used to this passage, so I'm going to read it in a paraphrase, just so you can hear it again in a different voice. When you find yourself flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through that will shoot adrenaline into your soul. We borrow light from our past. We borrow light from walking wounded. As Peter Gregg says there, but we know that there's an anointing and authority that can only come to us through darker trust of unanswered prayer. Not only that, we borrow also light from Jesus' presence. We borrow light from Jesus' presence. In these moments of apparent abandonment, lies of the evil one get planted in our soul. Uh, Pete, you, you hear these lies... Uh, like uh, many, so many that we've, we've helped people through here at Church on the Rock. People don't take you seriously. You aren't lovable. You'll never be happy. And one of those lies that comes up is God has abandoned you. It's just a lie. God will not abandon you. Beginning with many psalms, uh, of many psalms, they question, where are you? Have you left us? Is there no mercy there? And as a pastor, people have asked me, where is God when this happens? Where is God? It might be a, a big event like a 9 of 11 death camps. Where was God in all of this? And I know the answer. Not a while. Can I read you a psalm that you might know, but it tells you the answer to that question? Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll feel no evil. Why? For you are with me. Sometimes we need to borrow light from the presence of Jesus. Because he is with us in our darkest moments. There's an interesting uh, study that a, a man named Dr. Brenner did. He uh, uh, interviewed people that uh, got of uh, Auschwitz. And he asked how that whole experience affected their faith. He said those who had us like a a very cultural faith. Some of them lost their faith. But one thing he just found so interesting, he found out that 5% of the Jewish survivors of the death camps became believers. He wrote a book called Finding God in Hell. <laughs> Why? Because God is there, and if you reach out and ask him, he will tell you he's there. 
And he will be close to you. Why will he be close to you? Because I believe what the word says in Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. There's been times where I just have not understood God's, God's uh, uh, amount of action he's taken. I was in an abusive job, and I, I, I could barely stand being there. I had to go to therapy after that one. And uh, I remember 2 o'clock every Tuesday afternoon, I would walk down the hallway because I was going to be sort of reamed out by my boss. And I remember asking God, where are you? Where are you in this? You know what I heard the still, small voice whisper? I'm beside you. I'm strengthening, I'm strengthening you with my righteous right hand. I remember that hallway. You know what I did when I went down that hallway? I lifted up my left hand. Why? I'm holding on to God's hand. I walked down. You're with me. I'd sit down on the other side of this desk, and I would literally move the chair beside me to make room for Jesus. <laughs> And I would sit down beside Jesus. Where were you? I was with you. I'm helping you through this horrible and deep time you are going through. So we borrow light from the past, our past. We borrow light from the wounded who walk with Jesus. And we borrow light from the presence of Jesus. And guess what? Then we have light in a dark, dark place. We don't need to fear as much, do we? So, let's borrow the light. I'm going to ask our, our worship team to come up to lead us in worship. Um, if you are new here, we have our communion table. If you're a believer, you're welcome anytime to these next three songs to take communion. You have a prayer corner. If you are bringing burdens in with you, we will pray for you and with you. We have our, our giving tables because that's a part of worship too, to worship him in that way. And, and here's, here's my, my challenge to you. If you are in a storm now, as we worship, could you ask God this? Could you ask him, God, where are you right now? What are you saying to me? What are you saying to me in the quiet moments, as even as other people sing around you? Ask that. Ask that. And just before we get into worship, I'm going to want us to read a poem together, all right? I want to hear your voices when we read the poem. And, uh, you know, good, good to end a sermon with a poem, right? <laughs> uh, this poem was written by a guy called Joseph Scriven. Um, in uh, 1842, he fell in love, fell in love with this uh, young woman. And uh, he, uh, they were going to get married, and she was going to cut. She was riding a horse up to um, the wedding. He saw her and started to run towards her. She got to the bridge. The horse bucked. She hit her head on the way down. She died. He was so broken. This was in Ireland. Then he moved to Canada. He just had to get away from Ireland, so he moved to Canada. Twelve years later, single man, he finally was able to give his heart to another. And so they're planning their wedding, and as they're planning their wedding, she fell ill, so they had to postpone the wedding. They postponed the wedding three times. And eventually, she died, and he never married. And as his biography said, he never gave his heart to another. People wondered, how could you live again with God? And his mother back in Ireland wondered that too. So he said, I wrote a poem. Maybe this poem will tell you what's been going on in my heart. He, he didn't expect it to be known anywhere. But here's the poem that he wrote to say, Mom, this is what's going on in my heart. Let's read it together. And then we'll worship. Do we get that on a slide? Maybe not. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, we do. Thanks. Can we read it? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what a peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry 
everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged to take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord. Hear our prayer, Lord. Draw near to us as we draw near to you. If you're able to and would like to, would you please stand with us? We're going to worship our God with three songs. Um, just in case if you are new to Church on the Rock, um, there is a communion table at the back that I saw. So if you're a believer in Christ and you'd like to take part in that over the next three songs, please do that. Uh, there are some people in the back right corner as well. Um, and that's called our prayer corner. So uh, people over there with lanyards would love to uh, to pray for you, pray over you, and pray with you. Um, yeah, so feel free to, to move around as we worship. Carried a burden too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I hear it now, lay it down. All I know is I need you. Run to the Father, fall into grace. Done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, soul needs a friend. So
So just a few action steps as we finish up today. The first is that if you have your completed connection card, we'd love for you to take it just outside these doors and give it to the, the Welcome Center. And then you can get your free t-shirt. Um, and I am sure you will love that. Also, uh, this is the collection week for Operation Christmas Child. And so uh, if you've packed up a box, thank you for doing that. But if you still want to, then there's still a lot of time to do that. And so you can still... Uh, grab a box just over here today um, and go and fill that up. Um, you can also, if you want to collect things, but you're like, I don't want to. I don't want to fill that up. I want other people to do the heavy lifting for me. Then you can drop off any um, anything that you want to that you'd want to put in a box at the church, and we'll have the youth fill it up uh, later this week. And so, if you're like, yeah, I'd rather young people do the do the heavy lifting and the heavy work than me then we would love for that to happen. I personally would love for that to happen. I love putting the youth to work. Um, it's a perk of the job. Uh, also, if you don't want to do any of that and you just want to do it on your computer, you can actually go to packabox.com, um, and then you'll be able to pack a box there online. And so that's another great option. We would love for you to be involved in Operation Christmas Child somehow. Uh, just a big thanks for all of you who support Church on the Rock with your generosity. We couldn't do what we do without you, and we are so, so thankful for you. Um, there is ways to give here on either side of the gym. There's a table, um, and that will have uh, almost every way you could, you could possibly donate. Um, and so if you're interested in that, you can go to those tables afterwards. But we just always want to say thank you for your generosity. We couldn't do this without you. And now let me just close in prayer. Lord Jesus, you are good, and you are gracious. Your kindness is overflowing to us. God, thank you that you give us your spirit, and that as we go from here, we can be confident that we have your strength and your peace in us. And I pray that you would give us more and more of that each and every day. God, I pray that you would give us our daily bread. God, that you would uh, bring us through the week and that you would fill us with your kindness and your love so that we could be overflowing to the people around us. And God, I pray most of all that you would just keep growing us in your love and that you would keep allowing us to become closer and closer to your heart. I pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Go in peace.